Ethicsense.com. Uh, so I'm honored to be here and talk about this. As you can see, there's a very long list of authors. A lot of these are interns. So think of this not so much as, wow, this is an amazing piece of software that you know so many people have to work on. This is more like a lot of projects that didn't all work out, but then in the end we had something and everybody got a bit of the credit for it. So that, that's kind of what this means. Um, so the general motivation here is services. So the, the kind of applications these days that matter are usually looking something like this, where you have lots of users using lots of devices of many different kinds. Then those devices talk to some service in the cloud. That service is implemented by software that runs in a data center or more, one or more data centers. And um, all the things that we usually talk about at conferences that are so difficult to do, concurrency, parallelism, reactivity, interactivity, it's all there. Like, uh, all the complications are there. Now, what we don't want to do is, so this is a bit of a close-up view of what's in those systems, right? So you have a data center, it has storage, it has compute. You have clients, they have storage too, they have RAM, they have a DOM. There's all these complicated things going on. Now, if you, if you think about the system this way, you're in trouble because it's very hard to, to move data the right way, to keep it consistent, to figure out how, how to get things working, especially under failures. So failures are not just failures like rare failures, but everything in this system, like topology changes, is technically a failure. So if somebody shuts down their web browser to the server, this looks like a failure because the thing just went away. And on the server, if you have to restart the machine because you have to install a patch to the operating system, that's also a failure, right? So, so there's lots of failures, and they're not catastrophic things. They're just routine. Now, what we need is abstractions to help us not think about it in the way I just showed you. Rather, we would like to think about it as a composition of services using standard principles of composition that we do for any other software project. So. Um, the thing that's emerging in some sense is that our services uh, that we depend on, we can, we can build everything as a, as a composition of services. Now, the services, why does that help us? Well, it helps us because we can localize the failure model. So instead of thinking about how failures happen anywhere, we can think about each piece and what it does when failures happen. So if you have a stateful service, for example, you would like it to be recoverable. So if the machine shuts down or something happens, you can reload from storage and keep going. Uh, if you have a stateless service, you want it to just restart. It doesn't have any state, so it's fine to restart, start over. Things are good. If you have requests between services, they can fail too. You want to have a method of dealing with that. There could be retrying, could be tests, could be something else. Um, the other thing we want to localize is scalability. So uh, typically, these different pieces of the system have very different loads. So we want to be able to actually change the knob of scale individually for each piece. And people often love the challenge of scaling up, but the reality is to be cost effective, we also have to scale down. So you have to be able to pay as little as possible for a service that really doesn't have a whole lot of load on it. So what, what's emerging here is that you, you have sort of these knobs independently for services, and the services are internally, the, Partitioned. So there's also a new thing. We used to think of services as monoliths, but now they are partitioned. And the partitions itself can be scaled, so you can have more or less of them. And that can be done dynamically, and you can also handle failures that way. Now, today I'm not talking necessarily just about that, but the, the challenge that I'm addressing here is geo distribution. So think of all of this happening on a global scale, and that's definitely not a stretch. You know, companies operate globally all the time. What is the problem now? Well, it's actually mostly the same problem. So you still have failures, you still have scalability issues. So let's not just think we need something completely different. That the main challenge is the same, but there's one challenge that is much worse, which is latency. So generally, the trend is within a single data center, you can actually get those latencies down. And the more people work on sort of custom network stacks, software-defined nets, or whatever, latency inside the data centers are going down, and they're going to go down further. But across data centers, you can't really do that because of the speed of light. So today, when I just go and measure the round trip time between California and the Netherlands, I get 150 milliseconds round trip time, which is very slow for, for computer you know, time scales. Um, maybe it will be better. I guess it could be as good as like 60 milliseconds. But then once you hit the speed of light, you're done. It doesn't get any faster. Now, what does that mean? 
Well, it means you have to think about this nasty latency in this beautiful picture. And, and how do you think about this? Well, the, the naive approach would be to say, OK, I'm just locating my, my services in various places around the world. But I think, given what I have said earlier, what we can expect is something more like this, that we actually localize the geo configuration. So for each service individually, we make this choice as to where should this service be running in the world. And the answer could be that it is in one place, or it could be that this service is running in multiple places. So in these pictures I'm showing, some of these stateful services are local to one place, some of them are replicated. Um, there is a lot of good reasons for, for people to not replicate everything globally. It costs more to replicate everything globally. Uh, obviously, if you have four copies of something, you pay four times the price. So sometimes one copy is better. But there can also be uh, other reasons, like legal reasons, why your data has to be in, in a particular country, or you don't trust the government in that other country, so you can't put your data there. So it's important that programmers can choose where to place the data and how to replicate it. So this is actually why the work we have done in this work is a little different from most work which looks at geo-replicated storage. So we are not really talking about storage here. We are assuming how to durably persist information. Somebody has solved this problem. If you read all the papers that are out there, you, it's a solved problem. People know how to do it. Um, our problem is once you have this geo-replicated storage, you still want to build a service on top of it. You still have the problem of latency. Um, but in some sense, the problem for us is about caching, not about storage. So we're assuming someone else is persisting it durably if we want it persisted. But we have to worry about the caching and the latency. Now I'm going to talk about three things in this talk. Because uh, all of this is built as an addition to the Orleans Virtual Active Framework, I will spend some time introducing you to that framework, which has nothing to do with geodistribution. It's just about services. Then I will show you two solutions we have implemented for geodistributing this service. Um, one of them very simple, but still valuable. One of them more complicated and interesting, but also a bit more complicated. So what is Project Orleans? So Project Orleans, which has started for a while ago, Jim Laris was one of the inventors of it. So it's an open source actor framework for C Sharp. And it's really, the purpose is to make it easy to build fault tolerant, elastic, uh, composed services. It's publicly available, and we've got a lot of internal and external users of it. So a big user we have is uh, the Halo uh, web services team. All of their services are built on top of this. So not that this may matter to you, but you know, it's, it's always good to, to be able to show a customer. Um, now, the, the important thing here is what is the programming abstraction in Orleans? And we call these grains or virtual actors. And I want to expand a bit on what that is. So there's lots of very similar things that are similar but not the same. So you can talk about objects. You can talk about active objects, you can talk about actors, and you can talk about services. And if you squint, they all look the same, but if you look closely, they're all a little different. And the grain abstraction in Orleans is really trying to sort of put these things together and, and give it a semantics that matches those, those things. Um, conceptually, you can think of a grain as a microscopic service that has a built-in recovery. And why, do I, why is it microscopic? It's because a grain is really about a single piece of data. It's a single object, a single user. So, so here's another way to, to look at this. So on the left, I'm showing the programmer view, the, who writes it, the programmer who writes the applications. They would think as grains representing application entities, like a game or a user or something very specific, the chat room. Um, the important thing here is it's not a, a, a service per class, it's a service per object, right? So each grain, each individual user is sort of running their own little service, managing just the data of that user. And uh, the, this grain is identified by key, not by location. So you can just ask for the grain for user Tom, and that's how you address that thing. You don't have to say, go to server X, Y, Z, and URL, so and so. Uh, grains also exist perpetually, so they're not created and deleted like objects. I will expand on this on the next slide. The, the important part is on the runtime implementation. The runtime does the stuff that, you know, distrib the distributed algorithms you need to deploy these grains onto real machines. So when you have machines, you can organize them as a cluster. Orleans will manage that cluster, detect failures. It will create a directory, a distributed directory, to find grains in that cluster for you and do all that. Um, now, 
what uh, I want to expand a bit on the difference between the, the virtual actor and objects or actors. So typically for objects or actors, we think of them as something that is created before we use it. So if we want an object, we have to say new, uh, or we have to allocate it in the stack. And then we, well, after we have done that, we can use it. And then at some later point, maybe if we don't need it anymore, it will be garbage collected or somehow deleted, and then it's destroyed. Now, now for grains, what we want is the thing to actually always be there conceptually. So the first line here, I'm asking for user Frank. This is the key. I'm not actually creating a grain. I'm just creating a reference to that grain. And then when I'm, when I'm doing something with that reference, the system will automatically load that grain into memory if it's not already in memory. And then if I'm done using it, it will stay in memory for some time. But if it's not used, just like in a cache, it gets removed from memory. But it doesn't mean it's not deleted. It's just temporarily not in memory, just like virtual memory, which is why this is called virtual actor in some contexts. So there are typically two types of grains. The distinction isn't always crystal clear, but conceptually, Grains can be volatile or persistent, and it's a bit like a stateless service and a stateful service. So a volatile grain, the state is gone if you have a failure or if you restart it. And that may seem broken to you, but it's actually very commonly done, because often when you restart a grain, you can actually just reconstruct the state. For example, if you have a grain that is monitoring users that are currently connected, that is not information worth storing, because it's about something that is happening right now. So it's just, it's just a matter of collecting that information again when you restart. Um, on the other hand, you have persistence grains. They're a lot more like databases, because they will actually store state persistently, like a user profile or an account balance, where you really don't want to lose the state. Now, the durability is an interesting part here, because in the Orlean story, durability is not provided by our system. It's actually external. So if you want to store your grain state persistently, you use a storage system of your choice. And uh, I think it's an important lesson for us that pro uh, programmers actually like that. They like to be in full control about where the data is stored. So if we went and told them, we'll persist the data for you, they, they, they wouldn't be quite happy because we can probably not compete with other storage services out there that they can get. But if, in this way, they can, you know, get the full choice of cloud storage that's out there is an option for them. It could be a SQL database that they're using. It could be Amazon, uh, whatever, EW, whatever it's called, I forget. Azure tables. Yeah. Um, OK, so let, let me give you a little example of what the code would look like. Um, so if you have clients posting messages to chat rooms and administrators banning users, you could make a grain for each chat room, and you could make a grain for each user. So here are the interfaces. So I have a user interface here, which um, has two calls, two service calls, ban, which removes, sets a flag to not allow this user to post. And has a call may post, which can be called to determine if this user has the right to post. And then on the on the other hand, I have a grain for each chat room, and you can see that the users are identified by a string key, and the chat rooms are identified by a GUID key. That's just some arbitrary choice. Um, but on the on the chat room, you have a post message, uh, a post operation, which will post the message, and you have a read operation, which gets the current thing. And the chat room could be implemented like this. Uh, so let me go to the next slide. Um, so what would I do have to do here? So at first I would uh, here. The, oh, that's not working. Let's see. So at the top you can see I would specify list string as the state that should be persisted for this because it's a it's a chat room. So it's a list of string. Those are the posts. And then I had um, here is the read operation. Basically, I'm returning the state. So because I inherited this class here, I can just use this uh, inherited um, property to get the current state, to read the current state. And then to post, uh, I would have to first check. So I will write some code where I get a reference to the user information for the user who is posting. Then I call that user grain to find out if I'm allowed to post, and then if not, I would return. Otherwise, I would add the post to my state, and then I would wait for that state to be persisted to storage. So you can see here, there's, in, there's two locations here, namely here, where there's an await keyword, and there's an await keyword here. So those are asynchronous continuations. The compiler will automatically create an asynchronous continuation there. 
wait for the I.O. operation to finish before continuing. So you see this is a very simple example, but you can, you can get the flavor of how you write a service in this framework. Now, what do we do about the Geo story? So first, we start with deploying multiple clusters. So in multiple data centers, in each data center, we'll have a cluster of machines. And then we have to have some story of coordinating the state between those clusters. And that's the new feature that wasn't there before. Uh, as, as of storage, we treat it as a separate layer. So as I said, um, it, it could be that the programmer puts storage in one place in the world, or it could be that they put it in two places. But uh, the important part to know here is just that in, in case, you know, sometimes you don't know this if you read marketing about storage you can buy. But it's not possible to do this perfectly. There's like theoretical results. It's like a, a quantitative version of the CAP theorem. You can't actually read and write uh, and have strong consistency without having to pay a, a, a round trip time between your nodes at some point. Um, so it's just good to know. Perfection is impossible, so we have to settle for something somewhere. Um, now, what do we do? So the first solution is simple. Basically, we just uh, let you add an annotation on a, on a service act on a grain that tells us this thing could live anywhere in the world, which means that when you, t when you send a message to this grain, it will check in the whole world, basically, if anybody has an activation. If nobody has an activation, it will create it locally. And then route all the, all the activation, all the calls to that activation. So there is a protocol, and this is one of the distributed protocols we implemented to make sure that you don't have two of these activations. And that protocol, like all protocols, has a little bit of subtlety, so there, ha there are race conditions we have to take care of and, and things like that. Um, now, what is the performance of that? Well, it very much depends. If you have, the best situation is if you have a volatile grain, um, shown here in this thing, I have these squares, they represent clusters, the, the, the little bullet represents an activation, and the, the red arrow at the top represents, um, what, one minute? Oh, geez, I am totally out of time. Okay, so, well. So performance depends, it can get really bad, especially if you have the worst case uh, scenario. Now, boy, I, I did not plan this correctly. Well, you got the most important message. So now, the, the other API we have is a versioned API, where when you access it, you can access locally and you can read and write locally. The important part in the message here, in the API here, is that the messages, um, and, and have a different uh, state interface where basically I separate the event of what happened from how it modifies state. So I'm actually tracking my messages as events called message posted events and I have, a, I have here code that can apply it to the state. This means that when I use this in my implementation, um, I have when I post a message here, instead of applying it directly, I enqueue an event representing that message. And when I read, uh, I can re read a tentative state. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's a background consistency model that continuously uh, writes these queues to the master copy, if you want. So when you, when you raise an event, it goes into the queue, and you can read your local state, which is a composition of the confirmed state and all the, the states in the queue. And automatically, those events will propagate to the global state and also automatically the global state will be sent to all participants. Now, what kind of inconsistency could you see? Well, in the chat example, it could be that when you, when you raise an event, you're not seeing the current history. So for example, in the bottom you see, A says, who wants to volunteer? And B says, sure, I have time. And the, it, B sees this appear in its timeline. But the reality is, in the meantime, what they didn't see, somebody else already applied. C already said, I will do it. And A said, thanks, C. So now, you can see B sort of re replied to a stale state. So that's the kind of inconsistency you run into. This is the cost you pay for having no coordination requirements on each all reads and writes. But you can restore this with on-demand linearizability. So we'll give, we give you some fences where you can actually insert, you can wait for this stuff to propagate and be sure that it happens. So linearizability is still possible. Now, to make this work, we need several protocols. So um, given that I really don't have much time left at all, I, I will not be talking about these beautiful protocols, and I will not be talking about 
performance results. So one, the only thing I want to tell you about the performance results is that, um, that the replication actually costs us for throughput. So it does, does save us for latency, but if the system is fully loaded, then we do more work than the single instance policy. Because having replication means you do more overall work, and if the system is perfectly balanced and perfectly loaded, doing more work just means less throughput. So that's kind of a nice little thing that we discovered. Um, so the conclusion here, uh, so we have new extensions to the Orleans framework that allow programmers to implement and compose elastic geo-distributed services. And in certain situations, this will significantly improve latency because you can read and write local copy without global coordination while still getting strong consistency where you need it. And the throughput uh, can also be much better in some cases, especially to a batching effect. Um, and all of this is publicly available, so if you want to try it out, you're welcome to do so. Thank you.